In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning at 3 a.m. in Colombia, Father Basilio Meramo died. He was ordained in the Society of St. Pius X. He was a priest for many years in Colombia. He was an old fighter. You can see with the death of all the recent deaths with Father Bormo, Father Iscara, Father um, Brian Hawker, and now Father Maramo. We're watching the some of the old guard of the SSPX starting to die that were rallied around Archbishop Lefebvre in the fight for tradition. So this was a letter of Father Maramo to Bishop Fillet replying to his expulsion from the society because he, like many priests of the Catholic resistance in 2012, uh, were outspoken because you cannot hide the truth and you have to expose compromise, you have, you have a duty to expose error, and you got to name the wolves also, as our Lord did, as many saints did, as Archbishop Lefebvre did. He named the wolves by name. People think that's uncharitable and mean and cruel, but it's more cruel not to point out and name the wolves. <laughs> Quite simply because it's more deceptive. So if you name the wolf, everybody knows who to stay away from. So Archbishop Lefebvre would name uh, Cardinal Ratzinger by name, Pope John Paul II by name. He would name... Don Gerard of the monastery in La Barou in France, who compromised with Rome in 1988. And Father Bisig of the St. Peter's Society, who compromised with Rome in 1988 also. So he named the names, and that has to be done. So here, Father Maramo, he wrote in 2009 this letter. So this is three years before 2012, where it was very clear where the new SSPX was going and compromising. So he saw it early, and he was already barking loud against these compromises, and that's why he was unjustly expelled by Bishop Fillet. So here's his letter to Bishop Fillet from 2009, and it's right on target. And it could still be said today, unfortunately. On April 7th, 2009, I received a hand-delivered notification of my expulsion, a thing to be expected after two canonical admonitions. It is, let me say at once, unjust and invalid, both juridically and theologically, since the two admonitions were per se inconsistent and were immediately acknowledged as such by me in my two letters of response. I appeal to eternal Rome against the decree of my expulsion according to Canon Law, Canon 647, paragraph 2, number 4, which suspends any decree. Thus, juridically, my expulsion would be suspended, lacking juridical effect until the appeal is judged that is, indefinitely. Indeed, this is because today, eternal Rome has been invaded by unworthy prelates who do not fulfill their duty of confirming the faithful in the faith. On the contrary, they corrupt and prostitute the faith, cult and morals, and violate the truth, whose rule they abhor like antichrists. Never has a greater abomination and desolation been seen in the holy place. They promote adoration of themselves as God, invoking the divine power which they pervert and invert. For this reason, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre said that Rome is occupied by Antichrists in his June 30th, 1988 declaration. Ironically, the topic of my expulsion remains suspended until the parousa of Christ. Notwithstanding, it falls to me to bear with patience and integrity this injury, remaining firm as a Catholic priest in the front lines against modernism in the Antichrist Rome. This is what Monsignor Lefebvre in that same document called the modernist and liberal Rome that persecutes the holy and infallible Catholic tradition. 
It is to this Rome that you, along with the direction of the SSPX and the three bishops, cowardly deliver us under the appearance of a, of a making good action, yet thrown yourselves into the arms of Benedict the Sixteenth, who was able to tempt you into a skillful trap. Acceptance, accepting the council is accepting the French Revolution in the Church. Now, if you permit me, I will go on to refute the most serious of your fulminating but absurd charges in their theological doctrinal context. I was charged with making false and grave accusations against the General Superior of the SSPX. Of course, serious damage by opposing him of being obstinate, rebelling against authority, causing scandal, etc., etc., I would like to know, most reverend bishop, what exactly are these false accusations you said I have made? My accusations are grave, I agree, but not false. If falseness exists, it cannot be justly said to be on my part, but rather, forgive me, on yours, since you have been using a double language for a long time. Not because you are bilingual, but because of your great dilemma. How to enter into an agreement without allowing the treason to be noticed, covering it under a false appearance of good. Open brackets. <laughs> he's hard-hitting, but he's, he's accurate. He's true. And this happened in 2012, when Bishop Follet successfully steered the society into the arms of the new conciliar church. And he'll show how they were silenced they were the time bomb was detonated in a skillful way i read on his letter how is it possible to accept what you stated eight years ago in an interview in the daily la liberté on may 11 2001 published by dici number six on may 18 2001 that is that when bishop Follet said we go along with about 95% of the Second Vatican Council without being a liberal and modernist. The liberals and modernists themselves acknowledge that Council, Vatican Council II was the 1789 in the Church, according to Cardinal Suenens, that is, the French Revolution of 1789 inside the Church. Or as then Cardinal Ratzinger today, Benedict XVI, said, Quote, the problem of the council was to assimilate the values of centuries of liberal culture. Quoted in Archbishop Lefebvre, they have un uncrowned him in the introduction. Thus it is clear that whoever accepts 95% of Vatican Council II accepts 95% of the French Revolution inside the church and also assimilates centuries of liberal culture in the church. And 95% is a very high percentage. Then comes the great question, what are you saying when you affirm that you are going to dialogue with Rome on doctrinal issues? What are you going to discuss? The remaining 5%? This alone bluntly demonstrates the parody, deception, lie, and falsity of your position, all executed with the great appearance of seriousness, while in fact everything was becoming increasingly rotten. No longer a resistance, but a pact with masonry and ecumenism. What then remains of the Society of St. Pius X, of resistance against modernism, when one accepts, goes along with, or sustains 95% of that nefarious and atypical council, Vatican II? Indeed, its pretense to not be dogmatic is as absurd as imagining a square circle. As theologian Marine Sola and Monsignor Lefebvre have proved. Archbishop Lefebvre denounced the pact of a non-aggression between the Church and Masonry, veiled under the names of aggiornamento and openness to the world. You, however, are willing to enter into that pact. Regarding such a pact, he adds, further the Church no longer accepts being the one true religion the only road of eternal salvation, quoting Archbishop Lefebvre. Cardinal Ratzinger, today Benedict XVI, recognizes the false religions as extraordinary roads of salvation. As one can note in this text that despite its conservative bent, is deeply heretical. 
where he quotes Benedict. The values of the non-Christian religions have been excessively emphasized to the point that some theologians present them as ordinary roads of salvation instead of extraordinary. Acceptance of a Schismatic Conciliar Church Further, Archbishop Lefebvre stressed that in the eyes of the Roman authorities as well as our own, this council represents a new church that they call the Conciliar Church. He also affirmed that this council was schismatic. Notwithstanding, you can uphold 95% of it. Doing so, you become 95% schismatic. Here are his words. In view of an external and internal analysis of Vatican II, that is, analyzing its texts and the details of this council, we believe that we can affirm it is a schismatic council, says Archbishop Lefebvre because it rejects tradition and breaks with the church of the past. It is by the fruits that one judges the tree. Thus we have the paradoxical and absurd situation of you accepting 95% of the schismatic and apostate post-conciliar new church. Hence you would be 95% schismatic and apostate, not an insignificant percentage and you still pretend to be a faithful and worthy successor of Archbishop Lefebvre, if this is not falseness and treason, then I don't know what it is. Nefarious consequences of a, an accord or agreement. Archbishop Lefebvre considers that, quote, all those who will cooperate in the application of this inversion of values, accepting and adhering to the new conciliar church, enter into schism. Yet today... You intend to reach an accord, an agreement, with the schismatic new conciliar church. Further, you want to, the Society of Pius X to be recognized and regularized by modernist Rome, which practices an apostate ecumenism. This is how Archbishop Lefebvre described it. Those who, motivated by laicism and apostate ecumenism, either minimize or deny these traditional riches can only condemn these bishops of the Society of Pius X. Doing so, they confirm their schism and their separation from our Lord and His reign. Spiritual Journey, page 9. Yes, it is an apostate ecumenism. This is the language of scriptures, which calls it the great apostasy, that is, the universal ecumenical apostasy. Yet you would bring us closer to this ecumenical apostasy. You want then to make us adulterous and schismatic, for according to Archbishop Lefebvre's words, quote, this apostasy transforms those members into adulterers and schismatics opposed to tradition and in rupture with the past of the church and hence with the church that remains faithful to the church of our Lord. Those who continue to be faithful to the true church are the object of savage and continuous persecutions. Duplicity also in the reply to Benedict's letter. In his letter to the bishops of March 10, 2009, Benedict XVI, after referring to the remission of the excommunication, called his invitation to the four bishops of the Society of St. Pius X to return as if they were prodigal sons a gesture of goodness and paternal mercy. However, he clearly and explicitly reminded them that they, quote, do not legitimately exercise any ministry in the church, given that they lack canonical mission or status. Their suspension ad divinis remains in effect as long as they do not accept Vatican Council II. Benedict XVI spelled it out in clear terms, quote, this will make it clear that the problems now to be addressed are essentially doctrinal in nature and concern primarily the acceptance of the Vatican Council II and the post-conciliar magisterium of the popes. The Church's teaching authority cannot be frozen in the year 1962. This must be quite clear to the society. Close quote. With this we see the objective of modernist and apostate Rome. But you and the other three bishops of the Society of St. Pius X tell us that you are going to Rome to preach the truth and convert it, etc. On March 12, 2009, only two days later, in your quick response to Benedict XVI's letter, 
you reached the apex of shame when you used his words to say, far from wanting to stop tradition in 1962, we wish to consider Vatican Council II in the post-conciliar teaching. This statement shows, forgive me, Bishop Follet, this shows your duplicity of language, a modernist and liberal language that manifests your falseness and betrayal. My expulsion is an abuse of authority that only favors the enemies. Therefore, Bishop Follet, it is, it, it is absurd and unjust for you to expel me from the Society of St. Pius X for publicly and openly resisting your sinister politics of merging with Vatican II, the landmark of the new conciliar church and its schismatic and apostate ecumenism. It is an abusive exercise of your authority, compromising with the worst and principal enemies of the church. You dare to falsely and injuriously accuse me of being a rebel, insubordinate, disobedient, obstinate, scandalous, subversive, in need of correction, harmful and dangerous to the common good of the SSPX. I could launch these same accusations against you to your face, but I will not because the divine judge will do this when he will come to judge the living and the dead. I leave it for then when I expect to meet you. Ooh. And remember, Father Maramo died this morning, so pray for his soul, and yes, he will meet Bishop Fillet on the Day of Judgment, when all will be made clear and true. I read on, however, I pray for you, that God will forgive you, because you know not what you do, either with the SSPX or me, whom you throw into the street like a vile delinquent. The same fate suffered by so many priests who opposed the innovations at the time of the council. You expel me at the age of 55 after having given myself a complete and generous commitment to the service of the SSPX, which I served for 29 years, leaving behind everything, renouncing everything to serve Holy Mother Church in the Society of St. Pius X, resisting and combating that apostate and heretical modernism which today you lead us toward, softly and sweetly, but surely. A new SSPX is being shaped in the likeness of the new church. Today you expel me for a new SSPX, a new society, recycled at the feet of the new conciliar church. I have never belonged, and I never want to belong to this new SSPX and new church. I will continue to be part of the true church and the true SSPX. You expel me, better said you excommunicate me from your new SSPX. But I don't care, just as Archbishop Lefebvre didn't care when he was excommunicated from the new church. This punishment, far from being a stigma or a front, is a true mark of decoration and proof of orthodoxy. He was not like you, the four bishops, who shamefully asked the excommunication to be lifted before the eyes of the world, refusing to bear the weight of the cross, considering it an ignominy. Open brackets here. Yes, it is true, and it has to be said again and again. The four bishops, each one of them had to write a letter, please lift the excommunication. As, and he'll, he'll show how evil this was and what a compromise this was. On the surface, they were telling us at the time at the priest meetings, well, if the excommunication is lifted, and uh, it'll keep, it'll bring people to us, and they won't be hindered from coming to our masses because they'll see the ex so so-called excommunication was lifted. But it's a lie because there was no excommunication. It's admitting a lie, and how God hates lies and deception. So Father Marano Maramo is correct here. And it's the four bishops, and I've said this before, all four of them have to make a public recanting of this letter to Benedict XVI. They have to defend the, the faith. And, well, haven't seen any letter yet, but let me read on. Christ did nothing of this sort. He did not step down from his cross, the greatest instrument of shame and suffering. He preferred to die crucified, ridiculed, spat upon, scourged, stripped of his clothes and abandoned by all. This is how he founded his divine church, leaving her an inheritance 
as inheritance his blood shed on the cross. This the apocalyptic significance of accepting the new Mass. This inheritance signed with his divine blood, his whole body immolated, is the Holy Mass. The same Mass that today you do no longer recognize as being the one exclusive Mass when you accept the spurious bastard new Mass, considering it the legitimate and principal ordinary rite, while the Tridentine Mass becomes an occasional extraordinary rite of the, of the new Church, which is or will be the sea of the Antichrist and the false prophet, as Our Lady of La Salette predicted. Rome will lose the faith and become the sea of the Antichrist. Let him who has eyes to see, and let him who has ears listen. Ironically, today you chop off my head without remembering that it was thanks to my intervention in the general chapter of 1994, asking that Father Schmidtberger not be re-elected, that you accepted the position of general superior. Indeed, for two years he had been arranging everything for his re-election. He was at the very point of achieving his aim when, surprisingly, contrary to his plans, you were elected. I stood up to tell you to accept that position as a cross, following the example of St. Pius X. Association of this punishment with the Passion of the Church. Here's the last section. This entire apocalyptic drama the Church is living is, a prophetically, encompassed, is prophetically encompassed in the Lenten liturgy, in a special and solemn way during Holy Week and in the Sacred Triduum, which shows us the desolate Church, the stripped altar, and the empty tabernacle. It is a clear depiction of what happened 2,000 years ago with the passion and death of Christ. It is also a symbol of what would happen to the Church, the mystical body of Christ, during the apocalyptic end times. I ask God to forgive you, Your Excellency, along with the chapter that, like a Sanhedrin, condemned me and expelled me. It reminds me of what the, the, the then-elect people did to our Lord Jesus Christ according to the words of the liturgy. The impious one said, Let us destroy the just man, for he is against our works. The fifth antiphon of Lauds of Holy Saturday. By the words of the prophet also come to mind, The Lord God is my helper, therefore I am not confounded, and I have set my face as a hard stone, knowing that I will not be confounded. Isaiah 50, verse 7. True, since my alternative was either to be silent, in a vile silence, before what I see, or to clearly and firmly speak out at the price of my expulsion, I fulfilled my priestly duty without betraying God or my conscience. Now my only choice is to wander, carrying my head in my hands, as St. Dennis did before he fell and died. I bid you farewell during this tragic and expressive sacred triduum of Holy Week, filled with mentions of what would happen to the Church in the last ap apocalyptic times, which is nonetheless the necessary prelude for the future Easter and Resurrection. Father Basilio Meramo, Orisaba, Good Friday, April 9th, 2009. That was in Colombia. So yes, so that was 2009, and then in 2012, it was very clear, Bishop Archbishop Lefebvre, excuse me, Archbishop Lefebvre was betrayed by his own sons. And it was in 2012, it was very clear, Archbishop Fillet, set on a new path. And in that same year in April, the three bishops, Bishop Tissier de Malare, Bishop Galareda, and Bishop Williamson wrote a very good letter to Bishop Fillet saying, this has gone too far. Don't go in with Rome. Turn around before you cause division, scandal, and loss of faith. But it was too late. And then Bishop Bishop Fillet, with the, with the two assistants, wrote back a scathing letter, your schismatic attitude, your set of contest attitude, and kind of mocking them. And uh, they, 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 they went in with Rome, and we know this by the signed and sent doc, doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012, which was a, a document of betrayal. And even Bishop 
Fillet admitted that it was a double-tongued document. He said in his own words, if you look at it with dark sunglasses, it looks traditional. If you look at it with pink sunglasses, it looks liberal. And he signed on a modernist document. So someday, when the church recovers and comes back to tradition, she will condemn that document and condemn all those who signed it. And Bishop Fillet has never recanted it. He's never condemned it. It still remains a document of the Society of Isaac X, public and sent to the Pope. And a terrible scandal. And everyone says, oh, well, you're stuck on that doctrinal declaration. Um, get over it. It doesn't apply anymore. Well, it doesn't. That was the 30 pieces of silver. Then came the six conditions for the agreement with Rome, which is terrible, a terrible betrayal, these six conditions, and flimsy as ever. It's selling the tradition with a sign on the front lawn for sale, traditions for sale. And, and then in this, in, in one, one other letter from Father Maramo, he mentions that the society was like a time bomb of resistance against the errors and was raising its voice against the errors of Vatican II and the New Mass. And Bishop Fillet, you don't take a hammer, he says, you don't take a hammer and an axe to detonate a bomb, to make it not go off. You have to just gently switch a few, a few buttons or a few levers, and it's detonated. It, it will not explode. And that's what Father Maramo says Bishop Fillet did in, 2000, in 2012. It was skillfully silenced, the SSPX. So now uh, they don't speak openly in their pulpits against the scandals of Pope Francis. They don't condemn his documents publicly. They don't speak out against the political figures that are, that are passing immoral laws. And for goodness sake, they didn't even condemn the Fauci Auchi, which should have been condemned because of its close link to aborted babies. And so they were ashamed even to condemn that. So they become bunny rabbits. And it's sad to say, this is, this is not the SSPX that Archbishop Lefebvre founded. He founded it for the priesthood and the mass, yes, but also to fight against the wolves. So... So in 2012 arose the Catholic resistance all over the world, and many priests stood up. And everyone turned to the bishop that was expelled, Bishop Williamson, to that he would lead. And not and not he didn't have to do anything great, just continue the work of the SSPX. Just continue. Nothing extraordinary. He didn't have to bend over backwards and travel all over the world. All he had to do was continue the work of the Society of Pius X. But perhaps because of our sins, because perhaps we tr traditional Catholics became too liberal and too soft and too compromising that maybe we didn't deserve Bishop Williamson to do what he should have done. Perhaps we didn't deserve it. And he didn't. And he said, he would come out and say, we don't need structure and organization. We don't need the resistance, but, uh, but we can have the resistance. Put away your toys. Don't think about another SSPX. I'm not another Archbishop Lefebvre. And so on and so on. And just, just completely blasted the hopes of a resurgence of the resistance. And so maybe it's because of our sins. Let's be honest. Perhaps it's because of our sins. We didn't deserve that. And ever since, the resistance has been struggling on the shoulders of a few faithful priests. And again, Bishop Williamson, thank God he did consecrate bishops. He's consecrated six of them. Of course, where are they? Where's their voices? We don't hear them. We just, here in the U.S., you don't even know one of them exists. Because everything's done in silence, nothing's announced, nothing is, there's no public letters, there's no public sermons, no public catechisms. So 
what good are dogs, consecrated bishops, if they don't bark? They're not good bishops, and if that's the case. So all I can say is, well, let's keep praying that one or two of them will rise up and do what Bishop Lefebvre would expect them to do. Feed the flock, preach the faith, condemn the heresies and errors of Vatican II, and, and also those who are compromising the faith by name, and continue the work of the church. That's all. That's all. This is what's demanded of bishops. And woe to them if their silence leads many to hell. So let's pray for that. And maybe God will raise one of these bishops or two to just continue the good work of Archbishop Lefebvre. And I guess there has been attempts under Bishop Four. He had the seminary begun in France, which was objectively good. Objectively, it's a good thing. We need good seminaries. But they were all very silent about the whole new doctrine that started to be taught in 2014 by Bishop Williamson. Bishop Williamson started to teach a new novelty that nobody expected this, that the whole thing about new mass miracles, the whole thing about new mass gives grace, the whole thing, the whole not, uh, you can't call him a heretic, and I never have called Bishop Williamson a heretic. I've been accused of that, but that's false. And I never attack him as his person. I have the greatest respect for Bishop Williamson. He's a giant, a genius giant compared to us pygmies. But his erroneous opinions, it doesn't matter who says them, needs to be resisted. And if, if, any, if any priest or bishop starts saying, imagine Bishop Follet starting to say the new mass can nourish your faith. He, he'd be blasted out of the water. So it doesn't matter who says it. It's wrong. It's, it's an opinion. Yes, it's an opinion. So is uh, the whole supporting of the new mass miracles. It's his opinion. He says it's based on objective fact of the scientific evidence. But it's Mother Church who has to declare if it's a miracle or not. So we leave that decision to Mother Church. And we've always done that. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre said we have to do with these modern apparitions, like Medjugorje, Bayside. Don't pass any judgment. And if they say things that are against tradition, that shows they're from the devil. Like Medjugorje is very ecumenical. It's from the devil. Same with Bayside. Uh, saying to stay in your parishes where the new mass is. This came from the devil. Even though the apparition said, pray the rosary and many good things, but the devil deceives with one hook of truth. Oh, excuse me, 95% truth and one hook or 5% of a lie. So um, these are opinions and they're dangerous opinions. And I have spoken out against them uh, many times <laughs> and maybe too many times, perhaps. Perhaps, but with error, you can't bark against it too many times, I think. But I've never condemned Bishop Williamson, and that's foolish to say that. I, I have a great filial love for him, and I ask you to pray for him. If, if he dies this way, at least he has given to the church six bishops who still can show and shine their, their colors. They've been quite quiet. We don't hear them, but hopefully we will. And hopefully among those bishops, there will rise good ones to just, again, continue the work of Archbishop Lefebvre publicly, not in secret, publicly and openly. Like Christ said, I have preached in the temple. I have preached, preached in the public places. If you want to know what I taught, ask those who heard me. That's what every bishop should be able to say. So, again, this is um, the day Father Maramo died. He was a champion of Catholic tradition. And he died expelled and in the street, so to speak. So let's pray for his soul. And he was really one of the first resistance priests to catch, to see things early and react. 
Um, I was in Syracuse school at the time, and we were we were given a line, you know, about the the million rosaries and all this that it was a good thing. And okay, I was watching it, listening to it. Bishop Williamson was writing good letters at the time, warning the faithful, watch out, we cannot make a false agreement with Rome. And so he was right on that, and he did great. He did a great service to souls with those letters. And and then in 2012, it, it only hit me then, maybe a little late, but when I saw the response of Bishop Fillet to the three bishops, I realized this is a very serious direction now. We're now, this, the new SSPX is going conciliar. And then I had to preach against this. And then in the summer of 2012, after preaching a first mass, in June of 2012, mainly quoting Archbishop Lefebvre, I was silenced because I was quoting Archbishop Lefebvre saying, we cannot make an agreement with modernist Rome until Rome comes back to tradition, etc., etc. I was silenced and then I realized we, I have to do so. We have to do something for the good of souls, for the church, for the, the true SSPX. So that's when I went with Father Pfeiffer, and at that time, it was a good start. The Kentucky Seminary was a very good attempt to continue, and it should have been. And there should have been some things fixed down there on the practical level. And then when he went with these false bishops, that's when I had to leave. And so here we are after four years in Massachusetts, saying mass all over the missions. I now have a home, thanks to our Blessed Mother here in New Hampshire at the Oratory. As far as I can see now, it's God's will to take in young men to form them to, to be brothers and priests, if God wills. And I trust God will supply all that we need. Priests to help teach, so the missions don't get abandoned. There are 37 or 8 missions that I'm covering. I know that sounds crazy, but... I'm not going to say no to souls begging for Mass. I can't get there every Sunday, obviously. They might get Mass two or three times a year if they're lucky. But until we have more priests to help, and that's very possible. So, And I know the good Lord will provide a good bishop that will have the mind of Archbishop Lefebvre, continue the tradition, and focus on the good of souls and the glory of God. And so let's pray. Pray to the Mother of God to help us. And again, many people attack the resistance for saying, look, there's no organization, nothing's, it hasn't grown exponentially, it's been languishing. And I would say, yeah, partly yes, maybe because we didn't deserve Bishop Williamson to have that grace to do what he should have done, objectively. But I have to say, it was a good service to the church that he consecrated six bishops. We wish it was done maybe in, with, under different, different situations, different circumstances, whatever it is. But he's at least done it. And when he comes to his judgment, he can say, Lord, I didn't lead the way you wanted me to lead like my father, like Archbishop Lefebvre, but at least I gave you six bishops for tradition. So uh, let's pray that it'll go to his, his uh, mercy and merciful judgment because six bishops is, is a big thing. And let's pray for those six bishops to be like Archbishop Lefebvre and preach the faith and be fearless in condemning heresy and error and just imitate the great Archbishop Lefebvre. What, what better example can we have? Put all in the mother of God's hands. She is the mother who crushes heresy. She is the mother of all her children who turn to her. Let's beg her to hasten the hour of her triumph. Give us not only good bishops, but finally a good pope who will consecrate Russia, restore tradition, condemn Vatican II, condemn the new mass, restore the liturgy to the pre-55. And if Archbishop Vigano is the one destined by God to be the next good pope, he'll do exactly that. Consecrate Russia, restore the liturgy to the pre-55, which is really what where it should go, 
uh, considering all that history of modernism and the liturgical movement since 1955 and even before that. But, um, and he will restore tradition and condemn Vatican II in the new Mass. We know that. So maybe he's the one destined by God. We don't know. But it's sure, if there's anyone on earth that could do that role, it's him. So let's pray. Really pray. But don't lose hope. Our Lady runs the, the show with Almighty, her mighty Son. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.